说你别搞我的课，你知道吗？Hi everybody. Uh, we'll get started now. Can someone confirm that they can hear me, please? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few announcements. Uh, so there won't be any labs this week, uh, but labs will resume next week. Uh, there's going to be a quiz this coming Thursday, uh, November 12th. Uh, please see Canvas for the material that's going to be covered on that quiz and for logistical information. Um, there will be some extra pre-quiz office hours on Thursday at uh, the time shown uh, on the slide. Uh, and please see Canvas for the Zoom links. And also remind you that uh, the late drop deadline for Physics 214 is probably a little bit later than for normal courses, but you should check line path uh, to make sure of the actual uh, deadline uh, for P214 late drop. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, the relativity of simultaneity, which is a bit of a, a mouthful. Uh, but it's basically uh, a statement that events that are simultaneous in one reference frame are not necessarily simultaneous in another. And then we'll uh, get quantitative about that and, and talk about something called time dilation. And uh, if we have time, we'll then talk about how to make uh, mass out of energy and vice versa. Okay, so uh, the setup for this discussion is a little bit complicated. So uh, please pay attention. And if you lose track of things, you can always ask a question in the chat or uh, you can read in the textbook. So the idea is you have um, two friends named uh, Ryan and Peggy, and they're shown in that picture. Uh, Ryan is standing on the ground and uh, Peggy is on uh, this moving railroad car, uh, which is moving uh, to the right with a velocity V. And there are two firecrackers uh, attached on either side of the railroad car, as you can see in the picture. And when those uh, firecrackers explode, uh, they make a mark on the track uh, right below where they are. Peggy, in between her feet here, has a light detector box. And that light detector box glows red if it gets uh, signals from the two firecrackers, the light signals, um, at the same time, um, or it glows green if uh, they arrive at different times. So that's the setup. And now let's imagine that these two firecrackers explode such that Ryan sees the light flashes from them at the same time. So uh, the light from each of these firecrackers uh, goes to Ryan, and maybe I should draw them uh, going to his eye. So this one goes to his eye over here, and this one over there. So the light from the two firecrackers comes to Ryan, as shown. And he can also tell that uh, there are marks on the tracks. And when he goes to measure them, he sees that they are both uh, the same distance from where he was sitting. Call that distance L. So he can determine that the light flashes travel the same distance to get to him. And he saw the light flashes from them at the same time. So the question is, first, um, given that uh, Peggy is standing right in the middle between these two firecrackers, where was she relative to Ryan when Ryan, um, when the firecrackers exploded? Was she to the left, to the right, or directly in front of Ryan when those firecrackers exploded? So please uh, answer the poll. Can you get your answers in, please? All right. 
So um, over half of you chose the answer C. Uh, that's correct. So she will be uh, standing basically directly in front of, of Ryan when those firecrackers explode because she's halfway between the two firecrackers. And Ryan knows that those two firecrackers were equidistant from his position when they exploded. All right, so now in uh, Ryan's reference frame, um, were those light flashes simultaneous? Does he say that the firecrackers exploded at the same time? And the answer there, of course, is yes. He's gonna say these happened at the same time because they both flashed and they came to me at the same time. Uh, they travel the same distance and they're both traveling with the speed of light C. And I, you know, I, knew, I know the distance from looking at the marks on the tracks and I know the speed because it's light and they hit me at the same time. Therefore, they were simultaneous. So uh, given that and given the fact that Peggy and the light box in particular that's at her feet um, are both traveling to the right at velocity V, what color will Ryan think the light detector box will glow? So the light comes to him at the same time, okay. Um, at what relative times will the light arrive at this light detector box? Will it arrive, the light pulses arrive at the same time or, or a different time? So I'll set up a poll here for this. Uh, so you can choose the answer uh, A or B. Okay, so we're pretty evenly divided here um, between the answers A and B. So let me uh, sort of rephrase the question perhaps. Um, so the two light pulses arrive at Ryan at the same time. While those light pulses are traveling to Ryan, uh, Peggy and the light box are moving to the right. They're moving towards the pulse that was emitted by the right firecracker and away from the pulse that was emitted by the left firecracker. So under those circumstances, what color will Ryan think the light detector box will glow? He knows they arrived at him at the same time, but he also knows that the light box itself is moving. Okay, get your answers in please. All right, so uh, that changed the answers considerably. Uh, so uh, most people then chose uh, B, which is that he would say that the light signals will arrive at the box at different times. And that is correct. And you can see that from this uh, figure down here, um, which is basically what Ryan sees uh, happening. So um, the two light flashes arrive uh, at him at the same time. So that's depicted by these two light flashes arriving at uh, this little box R for Ryan at the same time. And if that's the case, and this uh, train is moving to the right, then the light box is going to see the light uh, pulse from the right firecracker first. And then sometime later, it's going to see the light pulse from the second firecracker. Uh, and notice that this, uh, this bottom uh, part of the figure here shows that the light pulse from the left firecracker hasn't yet reached Peggy, but so you have to like go further into, uh, you have to let the clock run a little bit further uh, before this pulse 
actually goes um, past the light box. And the light box detects it. So the light box will detect the right pulse first and sometime later, the left pulse. Good. Okay, so again, uh, this is what Ryan saw. He sees the two pulses arrive at him at the same time. That's what's shown by that part of the figure down there at the bottom. And he also says um, that the light from the right will arrive at the light box first because the whole arrangement, including Peggy and the light box is moving to the right. And the light from the left will arrive second. So he's gonna say the, uh, the, the box glows green. All right, so now let's make a similar drawing, but uh, instead of from Ryan's point of view, from Peggy's point of view on the train. So we're going to assume, uh, and this is a natural assumption to make, however, I emphasize right at the get-go that this is the wrong assumption to make. And the assumption we're going to, going to make is that she also sees the explosions as being simultaneous. So why is this sort of the natural thing to say? Well, if Ryan says that those two firecrackers explode at the same time, then we would expect that Peggy would also say that they exploded at the same time. In fact, just saying it like that, it seems completely natural to believe that. I'm telling you in advance that that's not the right assumption, but we're gonna make that assumption and see where it leads us. So you have to remember that she's also going to see the light moving at speed C in her reference frame, even though her reference frame is in motion with respect to Ryan's. So the question is, what color will Peggy say that the light detector box will glow? And this is sort of a, a way of encapsulating these answers that uh, Ryan and Peggy have that basically uh, summarizes uh, whether they see the same thing or different things. So, this is the picture that we draw for Peggy on the train. So if these two flashes are simultaneous, and they go off at the same time in Peggy's reference frame as well as in Ryan's, then what Peggy will see is these two flashes occurring at the same time. And then because they travel at the speed of light C, the light pulses from these two firecrackers in her reference frame, and in any reference frame for that matter, because the speed of light C is a constant, then what she will see is that these pulses uh, will come to her from the same distance each, because she's right in the middle of the car. So they're each gonna go, you know, a distance L over two to get to her. Okay. And they're both traveling at speed of light C, so they will both arrive at Peggy at the same time. And she will say, they are simultaneous. And she will also say, therefore, that the, uh, the light detector box will glow red. So again, we assumed, and I told you incorrectly, but we assumed that Peggy would also say, also see these two events as happening simultaneously. And because she's right in the middle of the rail car and because the speed of light is C, in her reference frame, just as it is in Ryan's, what she will then say is, oh, these two light pulses arrived at the light box at the same time. And therefore, the light box will glow red. Remember, um, Ryan said that the light box is going to glow green. So uh, what's the color of the light box and why? So let me launch a poll so you can answer this question.
Okay, please get your answers in. All right, some people are saying they can't see the poll. Hopefully you can see other polls. As long as you answer at least one, you'll be okay in terms of credit. All right, so here's what people uh, chose. And um, most people chose the correct answer, uh, which is B. Um, the light box will glow green uh, because Ryan saw these explosions simultaneously. He was equidistant from them and light travels at V equals C. In order to explain uh, what uh, Peggy was going to see, we first assumed that she was seeing them simultaneously and then uh, figured out under that assumption what she would see and what the light box between her feet would detect. So, what we need to do is re-examine that assumption. So um, this figure here on the right-hand side shows uh, what Peggy would have seen if she had seen the flashes as simultaneous. Okay? But we know that she didn't because we know the, the, the light detector box glowed green. And so there's something wrong with uh, that picture on the right. So uh, what would Peggy say if asked whether or not the light flashes were simultaneous? Well, she's not going to see them arrive at the same time uh, if we believe Ryan. So we're kind of left with an inescapable conclusion. And let, let's try to uh, encapsulate that in this uh, concept question. So if Ryan measures, um, two times TL and TR, one for the left and one for the right firecracker. And he does that by uh, setting up some, um, some stopwatches, okay? He, so he has two stopwatches and he starts them going at the same time. And then he waits for the train to go by. And then as soon as the light arrives at his eyes from the left and from the right, he stops the left and right uh, stopwatches. Okay, and he looks at those times, and those are TL and TR. Peggy does the same. <clears throat> These are labeled TL prime and TR prime because she's in the S prime frame. So what can we say about uh, these two times? How are they uh, related to one another? All right, get your answers in, please. All right. So most people chose B. Uh, that's the correct answer. So uh, what this tells us, though, is that Ryan, who's got these two stopwatches, um, he measures them to be to have exactly the same time on them. So in other words, since TL minus TR is equal to zero, he says that these events happen simultaneously. Uh, but Peggy is going to measure different times for TL and TR prime. And so she's going to say, that the events were not simultaneous because TL prime and TR prime are not the same, but she's right in the middle of the, of the two firecrackers. Um, so what this says more generally is that events that are simultaneous in one reference frame are not necessarily simultaneous in another. So that's what's meant by relativity of simultaneity. More importantly, because simultaneity 
and time are intimately related. And remember that Einstein quote that says, uh, when you talk about time, what you're really talking about is simultaneous events. If you say that a train arrives here at the platform at 7 p.m., what you're really saying is that train and the small hand on my watch reaching seven will happen simultaneously. The train will pull into the station and that my small hand on my watch will, will point to seven simultaneously. So that's what we mean by time. So if simultaneity is not an absolute concept, then neither will time itself be an absolute concept. So let's explore that a little bit further. So just to summarize uh, what we saw with uh, Ryan and Peggy. So the, the left figure is again, what Ryan saw and the right figure is what Peggy sees. So in the left figure, on the, standing on the ground, these two pulses occur at the same time, simultaneously in Ryan's reference frame, they travel because they travel the same distance and they arrived at the same time and they're traveling at the same speed, speed of light C, and they arrive at, at Ryan at the same time and that's what's shown by the bottom part of the left figure. However, what Peggy sees in order to be consistent with this is that the right firecracker blows up first. Then the light from that right firecracker passes over her and the light detector box. And then eventually uh, reaches Ryan. And sometime after the first firecracker blows up, the second firecracker blows up and emits its light pulse which hits Ryan at the same time as uh, the light pulse from the right-hand firecracker. But sometime later, we'll, uh, we'll reach uh, Peggy and the light box that's at her feet. So in Ryan's reference frame, the two firecrackers really do explode at the same time. That's just a fact. In Peggy's reference frame, the right firecracker really does explode first, followed by the left one. That is also just a fact. So these two statements sound logically inconsistent, right? Happen simultaneously in one reference frame, but not simultaneously in the other. But that's only if you stubbornly cling to that old fashioned outdated notion of time. The time is not an absolute quantity. And therefore, simultaneity isn't either. Now, remember, when we assumed simultaneity, we ended up with this logical inconsistency that, you know, Ryan said, uh, because I saw the two light flashes come to me at the same time, that means that Peggy uh, must have seen them arrive at that light detector box at different times, and therefore, it should glow green. But if we assume simultaneity in all reference frames, then Peggy would have to say, uh uh, no, you're wrong. The light detector is going red because the two pulses arrived at the same time. They can't both be right about that. So the only way out of that is to realize that, they, that the, the assumption that simultaneity is the same, if you see something simultaneous in one reference frame, you'll see it in all reference frames, is wrong. If you see it simultaneous in one reference frame, you will not see two events as being simultaneous in a reference frame that's moving with respect to it. And that's what's shown uh, by this right figure. So now um, we've done away with all the logical inconsistencies. So we no longer have this Ryan Peggy logical inconsistency. They will both say that the light detector glows green because that's what they will both see. The reason they see it that way, they see the light detector going green is different though. In Ryan's case, it's because he sees, you know, the train moving to the right and he realizes that the pulses uh, were simultaneous. And therefore this picture is what tells him that the light box will see one light pulse and then sometime later or another and it'll, go green, it'll glow green. Whereas for Peggy, the reason she says the light detector glows green is because one of these 
uh, life, one of these firecrackers blew up before the other one. And then therefore the light, which had to travel, you know, the same distance, basically half, half the way across the train car to get to her, uh, arrived at different times and the light box glows green. So they agree the light box glows green. And there's no longer a logical inconsistency, but there is this weirdness that in one reference frame, uh, it's simultaneous and in another it isn't, which runs counter to our intuition because our intuition is wrong. Okay, so let's, um, so uh, sorry, green light means that uh, the two light pulses arrive at different times. Red means they come at the same time. Okay, that was, I was just answering a question in the chat. So um, let's quantify this a little better. Uh, and, and this falls under the, um, the heading of time dilation. So because simultaneity is relative, uh, we're also forced to conclude that uh, time itself is, um, can also be relative. And so to quantify this a little better, uh, we're going to use uh, something called a light clock, uh, which is illustrated by this figure uh, from the textbook uh, showing uh, a light pulse going uh, from a light source up to a mirror and bouncing off the mirror and coming back down to a light detector. I don't particularly like the way they've drawn this figure in the textbook because um, it, it shows the light moving along uh, different length paths uh, from the light source to the mirror then from the mirror back down to the detector. So I redrew it like this. It's basically the same thing. Um, so what happens is uh, we have a light source. It makes a short pulse of light and it fires that short pulse of light up to a mirror, a distance H, okay? And then it bounces off the mirror, comes back down again, is detected by uh, a light detector, which is in the same place as the light source, basically. That defines one tick of the clock. So the amount of time it takes for the light source, for the pulse to go up to the mirror and then back down again and be detected is one tick. And then just to make this, you know, a little more um, consistently like a clock, uh, what happens then is as soon as the light is detected, after it bounces off the mirror, as soon as the light is detected uh, down there, um, a new pulse is generated. And there's no delay in between those two things, just to make things simple. Uh, it immediately sends out another pulse, which then travels up a distance H, comes back down a distance H, and then there's, that's the second tick. All right, so that's our clock. And now what we're going to do is uh, make this light clock move. So we're gonna put it in reference frame S prime and we're gonna be in reference frame S. And we need to define what uh, our events are uh, in order to uh, keep things as clean as possible here in the discussion. So event one is gonna be the emission of the light pulse and event two is going to be its detection. So event one is right here when the light is emitted and event two is right here when it's detected. So the time between those two events is the length of uh, you know, the clock tick or the time between uh, ticks. And it's uh, in the reference frame S it's given by delta t equals t2 minus t1 and an s prime delta t prime equals t2 prime minus t1 prime. And what we're forced to, um, to take care and, be, and, to, and to be careful about is not assuming that delta t and delta t prime are necessarily the same because of our discussion before about simultaneity and how simultaneity is so closely related to time. So let's first uh, go through the wrong uh, analysis of this situation, and then together we'll do the right, uh, more rel the relativistic version. So in S prime, which is the rest frame of the clock, we have that the clock does uh, basically uh, this. So uh, the light pulse goes up and then comes back down again. So assume that I'm in S prime, I watch the light pulse go up and down again. It travels a distance to H, H going up and H going down. 
it moves at um, speed of light C. And so delta T prime, the amount of time that it takes for the light to go up and down again, for it to be emitted and then detected is this 2H over C. Now in S, it's a little more complicated. So uh, let's imagine that you are all in the S reference frame and I'm in the S prime reference frame. So in the S prime reference frame, as I said, I see the pulse move up and down. But what do you see in the S prime reference frame if I'm walking across as I do that? So I'll do that again, that was a great demo. So the pulse goes up and then comes back down again. Now in the S prime reference frame, what I see is just this. But of course, what you see is this. So I see the pulse go up and down like that. And uh, you in the S frame, see it go up at an angle like this and then come down in another angle like that. Uh, where it gets emitted and where the light pulse gets detected are two different places in the S reference frame. So uh, let's evaluate this more quantitatively. If the S prime reference frame is moving at a velocity V, then this distance here is given by one half V delta T. So delta T is the total amount of time it takes for the pulse to go up and back down again. And V is how fast uh, the reference frame is moving. And this one half is there because we're just taking this segment here and not including this other segment on the other side. And they're equal in size. So we just have a one half V delta T there. This distance here is of course H. And this distance here, the hypotenuse is one half times uh, the speed that light is moving times delta t. And again, that half is because we're just taking this first part and not the equally long second part over there on the right-hand side. OK. So uh, what do we put in for this uh, u light, the speed of light that you see as you're looking at this s prime reference frame? So again. Uh, the light moves you know, up and down really fast at the speed of light. And now on top of that, we're superimposing uh, the motion back and forth, sorry, the, the motion in, in this direction uh, to my right um, of the S prime reference frame as seen by you in the S frame. So if you think about it, the Pythagorean theorem tells you pretty simply that, well, the velocity of the S prime reference frame to the right uh, and the perpendicular uh, velocity of the light is C. And so the velocity of light that you see in the S reference frame as this S prime light clock moves past you is going to be um, square root of C squared plus V squared just by the Pythagorean theorem. And this is the right angle here. So, what we can then write down is, applying the Pythagorean theorem again, this leg of the triangle and that leg of the triangle and this hypotenuse of the triangle are related uh, by this expression down here. Okay, it's just a Pythagorean theorem. And U light, speed of light, is just given um, by the Pythagorean theorem that we applied before which is just c squared plus v squared square root. So I put that in there. And then I get, if I just you know, expand the terms, I get this. And if I now uh, solve uh, for delta t in this uh, equation, I get this. So delta t is just 2 over 2h over uh, c. And you notice that these two are the same. In other words, in this derivation, what we've determined after all that work is that the amount of time it takes for light to move from the source 
to the mirror and back to the detector is the same in both reference frames. It's 2H over C. So these two clocks, or I should say the clock in reference frame S prime will tick at the same rate as uh, the clock is viewed to click from the reference frame S watching as the clock goes by. However, uh, we made a fundamental mistake here. What was that fundamental mistake? So let me start another poll for you to answer that question. So I just reproduce, uh, you know, what the uh, equation was that we used. What was our fundamental mistake there? Okay, please get your answers in. Okay. All right, so most people chose uh, the answer B. Um, that's the right answer. So what Einstein told us was that in order for the physics to be the same in all inertial reference frames, not just the mechanics, but all physics, uh, we had to also take into account that Maxwell's equations, which describe electromagnetism, only give one speed for electromagnetic radiation in vacuum. And that speed is the speed of light C. And we blithely ignored that in this derivation, right? Because here is what we, we're putting in for the speed of light, U light. That's wrong. What should we put in for uh, the speed of light right here? What should we put in for U light? Anyone answer in the chat? That's right. We just put in C. The speed of light in that reference frame is going to be C. So again, what this means is that if I'm in the S prime frame, I see the, the light pulse go up and down, I say, speed of that light pulse is C. You watching the S prime frame go by, you see this light pulse go up and down, and you say along this path that it's traveling, it also travels at speed C. You don't add this extra velocity uh, that it has due to the motion of the S prime reference frame relative to you in the S reference frame. All right, so let's do that and see what happens. So uh, the derivation now is a lot simpler, but it has very big implications. So for U light, we're just gonna put in C. And now, if we solve for delta t, we see that delta t and delta t prime are not the same. Before, we showed that they were both 2h over c. But now what we see is that they are slightly different. And they're different by this factor of square root of 1 minus beta squared, where uh, beta is defined as the ratio of the velocity divided by the speed of light. It's a convenient thing to use, particularly when we have all these, you know, v squared over c squared floating around. Just replace them with betas. What this tells us is delta t equals delta t prime divided by the square root of one minus beta squared is that the time interval between the two ticks in the s prime and s reference frames are not the same. In one of these frames, the clock is going to tick more slowly than in the other by that factor. 
So let me do an example problem uh, to illustrate this and to drive home the fact that uh, it's a very small effect most of the time. So the question uh, reads as follows. Um, at what speed in meters per second would a moving clock lose, and by lose, I really mean run more slowly, uh, by one nanosecond per day, according to experimenters that were on the ground and not moving? And in order to solve this, uh, we're going to use the handy uh, binomial approximation, um, which just says quite simply that if you have um, of a variable uh, or a quantity x, and it's much smaller than one, then one plus x to the alpha is roughly equal to one plus alpha x, where alpha is some power. It could be two, or it could be one half, or minus one half, whatever. All right, so just to remind you, uh, this is where uh, we left off on the previous slide, delta t is equal to delta t prime over square root of one minus theta squared. And uh, we're not gonna use it heavily, but typically uh, one writes um, one over one minus theta squared is just gamma. It's just to save writing. Um, there's nothing, uh, no physics going on there. It's just, uh, just to save writing. Anyway, how do we proceed? So here's that equation that we, uh, derived by studying the light clock previously. And now we want to, <coughs> excuse me, um, relate that to the question at hand, which says that the people on the ground who are not moving, their clocks measure one day to have elapsed. The person who's moving around at some speed measures a one day minus one nanosecond to have elapsed. So the delta t is one day, and the delta t prime is one day minus one nanosecond. Now remember, one nanosecond is a small number, 10 to the minus nine, and one day is like 10 to the fifth seconds in a day. So there's uh, 14 orders of magnitude separating uh, those two numbers, one day and one second, nanosecond, I'm sorry. But anyway, we uh, take these, uh, this delta t and delta t prime, and, and they're related by uh, the expression that delta t is equal to delta t prime over the square root of one minus beta squared. And from that, we can then write down this expression for the square root of one minus beta squared, just sort of rearranging terms a little bit. And then we can apply the binomial approximation. So the square root of one minus beta squared is equal to one minus beta squared to the one half power and that in turn is approximately equal to one minus one half beta squared, as long as beta squared is small. And uh, it's gonna be quite small here. As you can see, if we set it equal to um, the thing on the other side of the equation and just rewrite what's on the other side of the equation as one minus one nanosecond over one day. So now if you uh, look at these two expressions, uh, you can see that the approximation that beta squared was small is a very good one because um, beta squared is roughly gonna be equal to one nanosecond over one day, which is a tiny quantity. Now we can solve for beta, which remem remember beta is equal to V over C. That tells us uh, the velocity of, that we have to move around with in order to, to, to have our clock run one nanosecond slower per day than a stationary clock. And that's given by, uh, by this, which looks kind of funny. Uh, so if we write that um, out as uh, seconds, so it's two times 10 to minus nine and 3,600 uh, seconds per hour and 24 hours in a day, and then solve, uh, we get that beta is 1.5 times 10 to the minus seven. That's a unitless quantity. So it's uh, less, much less than a millionth the speed of light. And we can then solve for the velocity by just multiplying beta by C. And we get 45 meters per second, which is about 150 kilometers an hour or 100 miles an hour, depending on your preference. So what this says, to put it in context, is um, if you wanted to take advantage of time dilation 
uh, using you know the, the fastest thing that most of us have available to us, namely a car, then uh, if for you know your entire life you drove around at 100 miles an hour and you lived to, I don't know, age 100, then you would have saved approximately 35 microseconds of life by doing that. Or put another way, if you drive around at 100 miles an hour for 100 years, then the clock that you have with you will move more slowly by about 35 microseconds than the clock of the person watching you zip around like crazy for 100 years. So it doesn't have a big impact. Uh, and, and in fact, zipping around 100 miles an hour will probably kill you much sooner than it saves you 35 microseconds. However, even though uh, at sort of normal pedestrian or even vehicular speeds, uh, it's not a big effect, uh, this does have an effect, special relativity that is, and time dilation in particular, for some modern technologies. And can anyone uh, mention in the chat what that technology might be that I'm thinking of? Yeah, GPS. So GPS satellites travel at 14,000 kilometers an hour which if you go through the math here, corresponds to um, their clocks moving more slowly by 7.2 microseconds per day. And they, they use uh, these, these uh, GPS signals, they use the travel time of light and you know, how, uh, when it arrives at your GPS receiver. And if these clocks in these satellites were going 7.2 microseconds per day slower, and we weren't compensating for that, then GPS would become useless in you know, a day or two. Because light travels pretty far in a microsecond. And if we're off by you know, tens or hundreds of microseconds in a few days or a week, then you just won't be able to find yourself using GPS. Okay, the last thing I'd like to cover is a concept called uh, proper time. Um, and this addresses the issue of how it can sometimes get kind of confusing to determine which, in which reference frame the clock is actually gonna be moving more slowly. Because after all, if I'm moving at some velocity V, uh, that's the same as you moving with minus V with respect to me. But if you think back to the light clock example, uh, there is one reference frame that enjoys a distinction. Uh, and that's the one in which uh, the clock is stationary. And in that example, that was the S prime frame. Another way of saying this, another way of saying the, the clock is stationary in that reference frame is uh, for the light clock, the emission and the detection of the light pulse occurred uh, or was measured by just one clock. There's just one detector there. Um, or another way of saying it even still is that the light pulse started and ended at the same position in that reference frame. So, I mean, that's illustrated by, if I can go back, um, by this figure here. So the light is detected at, is emitted and detected at the same place in the S prime reference frame. On the other hand, if you're in the S reference frame and you're looking at it, you see the light emitted over here. So here's your X axis. You see it emitted over here at this value of X and detected over here at this value of X. So there's some distance between those two, obviously. Okay. Um, so the time interval between two events that occur at the same position is called the proper time. And it's labeled with this, uh, uh, letter, Greek letter tau. And again, in that frame, the clock is not actually moving. I mean, it's ticking, but it's not changing in its position, um, uh, x or x prime, depending on which frame you're in. So in this case, in the s prime frame, the clock is stationary. It's ticking, but it stays at the same value of x prime uh, between ticks. And so viewed from the s reference frame as the s prime reference frame goes by, uh, it will be observed to run more slowly. And that's given by, by this expression here. 
So let me just conclude with this uh, learning activity. So your friend flies from Los Angeles, uh, takes off from LA and lands in New York, and she carries an accurate stopwatch with her to measure the flight time. So she starts the stopwatch right when she takes off in LA and she stops it when she lands in New York. And you and your assistants on the ground also measure the flight time. So identify first the two events associated with this measurement. So what are the two events? Can someone put in the chat what the two events are? Right, takeoff and landing are the two events. Takeoff in LA, this, the watch uh, that the, your friend carries is started. Landing in New York, it stopped. So who measures the proper time, if anyone? Is it your friend or you? So right, someone wrote on board. The, the friend who's in the plane, she looks at her, her stopwatch and if she stays you know, completely still for the entire five hour flight or whatever it is to New York, when she lands and she clicks the stopwatch again, in her reference frame, that watch will not have moved. So she measures the proper time. It's at the same position X prime uh, throughout the entire measurement. Um, whereas people on the ground, um, they have to measure the times at two different positions in LA and in New York. Okay, So um, who then measures the proper time? Well, it's your friend. And who will measure the shorter flight time? Also your friend uh, by a, a nanosecond or so. So again, flying around a lot, it is a way to uh, increase your time by increase your life by time dilation, uh, but other effects will generally <laughs> reduce uh, how long you live or at least the quality of life if you spend too much time on airplanes. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and uh, I'll see you next time when we'll talk about um, the space time interval. Okay, bye bye everybody. Uh, I had a question. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this isn't related material, but I, uh, I had, I just realized that I had uh, two midterms at the same time as the, as like the quiz, and I submitted. I went to submit the uh, conflict exam, and it was a little bit late, so I emailed Van Hook. Right. Uh, do you think it would still work out to get a conflict exam? Uh, probably. Uh, he. Uh, will typically contact people like 24 hours before the exam or roughly speaking uh, and he'll tell you uh, when the conflict will be held. So uh, I would suggest being patient and you know if you don't hear like you know a few hours before the exam um, or at least when you're last available because I know you said you had other exams uh, then you, you could contact him and, and ask him when we, we would be the makeup. Um, okay. I think uh, typically uh, it, it is possible, even though you did uh, ask for it late. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so I have a question. Yes. So this is about the Ryan and the Peggy uh, example that you showed. Okay. So if the cart itself is moving, uh, uh, let's say with speed C, uh, very close to C if possible. So the time difference, uh, like um, the time difference will be very big. So are you talking about uh, Ryan and Peggy? Is that what you said first? Yeah. Okay, let me just put the picture up here. Uh, okay. So the V velocity of the cart, let's say it's very close to C. Okay. So then uh, because the reference frame, uh, Speed itself is C, and the object, um, the light speed is also C. So, the left firecracker will never reach Peggy. Uh, light from the left firecracker. Well, it'll take a very, very long time, but eventually it will reach Peggy. Right. Uh, okay. So yeah, if, if I mean if 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 the velocity is uh, is is very close. It can't get, it can't be equal to C, but if it's yeah. very close to C, then uh, 
you know, that first light pulse will be seen very, very soon. Uh, and uh, the second one will take much, much longer to get to her. That's what Ryan will see when he looks at what's happening with Peggy. Um, you know, he'll basically see the, the, the right light pulse uh, go uh, through her light box very quickly. Uh, and then he'll, he'll basically see her, you know, on, on the train racing off with the, the light pulse behind, you know, gradually uh, catching up. Okay, so but the thing is, uh, again, um, so from the right side, it will be 2C and from the left side, that should be around zero. It's, let's say it's very close to C, like 99.999C uh, percent wise. So uh, won't it basically uh, be against Maxwell law? Uh, so what Ryan sees, if we just focus on the left flash, what Ryan sees is that the, uh, the light from the left, uh, from the left flash is moving at C, and uh, Peggy is moving at say 0.99 C, slightly slower, and so it's just going to take some time before that light pulse uh, arrives at Peggy. Okay. Okay. Now, what Peggy sees though, in her reference frame. These two light pulses are both moving at speed C. So the only way for her observation to be consistent with Ryan's is if she sees the right pulse go off. And then if she has a velocity that's really as high as 0.99 C, for example, she will see the left flash much, much later. So she will say that these are uh, very, very far apart in time, these two flashes. Okay. Thanks, and yeah, yep. I got it. Okay, uh, so I send you the email that you asked for. Yes, I, I got it. I'll uh, I'll look through yeah. it and uh, try to get back to you in a few days or so. Yeah, Dr. thanks. Tony, so. Quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for the for regarding like the quiz to um content, I can find the emails and saying what topics would be on the quiz. Is that just homework two and three? Um, so it should be on Canvas. Uh, hold on a second. Let me take a quick look. Um, so if you go to the main page, uh, so if at quiz two, it says uh, topics and rules, etc. So um, okay, all right. Let me take a look. I, I was looking at the announcements because Dr. Van Hoeven made like an announcement last last time, but I'll look at these. Yeah, here's the link. If you go to that link all right. in the chat, that'll tell you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Goodbye, everybody.